Welcome, welcome, welcome here to our next session of the Mars webinar series. Mars, your partner for market access and pricing strategy. My name is Lutz Wolmer and I will be your moderator tonight. And together with my good friend and boss, Stefan Walzer, who's the CEO and founder of Mars, as always the last Thursday of the month at 2100 German time and 1200 Pacific time, we have our webinar about the topics of market access and reimbursement. So just before we come to today's topic, the hospital funding and the NUP, some few words about Mars. Mars is your German speaking market access expert for Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. And we provide you with everything what you need about market uh, pricing, pricing strategy and reimbursement strategies for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And also with all the paperwork for the submissions for the Federal Joint Committee for DGAS, uh, the digital health applications here in Germany, for the Swiss BAG or the Austrian Hub Verband. And also we provide you with information and help with health economics if you need that, or also with negation support, including our virtual reality boot camps here, uh, our special um, VR training, so you're ideally prepared for authority meetings and price negotiations. Just give us a call. And also check out our Mars podcast every two weeks Stefan is discussing with a guest a trendy topic in market access so you can get it on all popular podcast platforms like for iOS Android or Spotify and many more and check out our last episode about the EU joint HDA and of course tonight's topic questions are welcome so uh, feel free to ask questions after the presentation which is about 20 minutes we will have time for your questions. You can either use the Zoom chat function or the question answer function here to raise your questions or comments. As always, slides will be provided afterwards and the video will be published on our website. And that brings us to our next slide here. Check out our last webinars. You can find that on our webpage, which is www.marketaccess-pricingstrategy.de. And there you find for example, the one with our good friend Renato Della Mano about the pricing strategy and is it art or science? Yeah, but now tonight, oh, and you can of course subscribe to our YouTube channel so you got the latest news about there what is published. And now our presenters and guests tonight, Dr. Marcus Talheimer from the University Clinics in Heidelberg. Really happy to have him here. Marcus Talheimer, who is the head of quality management and medical controlling. Good evening, Dr. Talheimer. Hello, good evening together. And of course, our speaker tonight, Dr. Stefan Walzer, who's the founder and CEO of Mars. And Stefan is a health econ economist with a long career in market access at Rush. And now he's a great consultant. Welcome to Weil am Rhein. Hello, Stefan. Hi, Lutz. Thank you for joining, Dr. Talama. And Lutz, just by the way, welcome back, right? Yeah, you have missed the last you. one because you're ill. Good to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so good to be here. And now we are coming to our topic about Stefan. So tell us more. What is NUP? <laughs> That's the cool question, right? So let's just basically build it up one step after the other. And then obviously, will be very keen to hear, let's say, also the, let's call it the inner circle of the kind of discussion. So what is happening then, especially in hospitals. So we're really looking forward then also to get the insights from Dr. Talheimer, who will maybe tell us some secrets about it. But I just come back to you, Lutz. Obviously, let's just directly start with maybe some basics, but I think it's important to have that frame then also um, uh, all together. So very simple quite easy start. At the end of the day, it's very important in Germany, if you have a new, let's say product mainly, and especially if you have a procedure, but obviously also, for example, the noops are also important when you have an inpatient drug. It is differentiated between the inpatient and the outpatient setting. And I think here it's especially also important that we have, let's say the kind of differentiation, um, especially when it comes to, let's say the permission, whether a product could be used. So in the inpatient setting, we have the kind of, let's say in German, it's, it's called the Verbotsvorbehalt, which means that all innovative procedures 
are permitted with the reservation of prohibition. And in the outpatient setting, it's basically all innovative procedures are prohibited until they have been officially approved, which is in Germany, allowedness for behind. But tonight, for sure, we'll just focus on the inpatient setting because the topic is obviously hospital and funding in, in hospitals for the new procedures. So what do you see here? And that's basically coming back to, let's say, Lutz's question. If you have a look on the right-hand side, what does it mean, a NUP? In German, it's Neue Untersuchungs- und Behandlungsmethoden, a very nice, small, little German word, uh, or let's say expression, it's probably better said. In English, it's basically new examination and treatment methods. That's one thing, and for sure, it's even more important, we hear that as well afterwards, because the NUP is maybe just the entrance, the ticket, basically for what is then called the Zusatzentgelt, the ZI, that's the additional charge or the additional reimbursement amount, which could then be added on top of an existing DRG. But we'll hear that as well in a couple of minutes. Very important here as well, for sure. Um, if there's a NUP, I think we have now as well, since a couple of years, the so-called potential benefit assessment for high risk procedures. And we'll also cover that in the next couple of minutes. So just generally, if you have a look inpatient, I think it's quite clear normally, but just frame everything around because we have as well the OPS, what you see on the right-hand side. So ultimately everything is financed through the so-called DRG system, the German DRG system, obviously. And we just combine here, let's say the two components. One is what does the patient basically have? So which disease that's then coded according to the ICD. And then we combine it with the OPS code. So it's basically the question, what is being done with the patient, the procedure around it, and then it ends up basically into the DRG system. And of course, we all know that in some circumstances, especially if, for example, innovations might get into the market, the DRG is maybe not fully and adequately be funded for that innovation. And hence, we need to have somehow a solution. But before that, very briefly only, um, obviously, you have as well the opportunity to apply for a new OPS in case the current ready procedures and the codes around the procedures are not applicable. And that's basically doable as well once a year. Um, let's say that the forms, the templates are available sufficiently to be done to the BFM. And very important here, it's not and cannot be done by the, um, from, uh, sorry, by the medical device or obviously pharmaceutical companies. It needs to be submitted then by the so-called responsible German Medical Society. But we'll not spend a lot of, let's say, time on the OPS. I think it's rather interesting because that's the kind of topic for tonight is then the NUB. So just imagine you have a new innovative kind of therapy or procedure and suddenly you obviously see hmm, it's maybe not enough according to the price of that kind of procedure. Then there needs to be obviously some kind of, um, let's say, additional funding. And that kind of lets a ticket in order to negotiate that important here as well. That can only be negotiated by the hospital. So that's also we're really looking forward to get for the insights in a couple of minutes. Um, and so the entrance ticket is the so-called NUB application. So that is the, let's say, the kind of question, is there something new? And second question, is it not really adequately then be funded? And that's the kind of question. Submission can be done uh, end of October. Um, that's as well done through the INEC. Templates are available, very important, especially. Um, and that's, I think also, I think what Dr. Talama might maybe cover very briefly at least. I think it's not just a simple PDF or a Word file to be uploaded, but there are, let's say, special forms which are then being used in the system as well. So just very brief kind of overview. I've just said it. Um, timeline for submission of the OPS is end of February. Uh, for the NUBs, it's end of October. And I think just recently it was also added for 18Ps only that there is another kind of time slot by end of April for such kind of submissions, decision maker, as already said, the so-called INEC. So what do you get then after that, right? So it's first thing is preparation of the template. The hospitals could take that, submit it to the INEC, that's end of October, and the INEC is evaluating the NUP um, applications. And in January, the INEC is then communicating the results of it. So there are basically four different results out there, status one to status four. You see it ready with a color code in there. Status one is green, is then hence therefore the best. That means basically, yes, it is a new kind of examination 
uh, or kind of treatment procedure. And hence the hospital is then allowed to um, negotiate an additional funding, the so-called Zusatzengeld, the ZE for that. If you get a status two or three, then this is unfortunately not doable. So either it's not new, it's not innovative, it was maybe not for the first time submitted, et cetera. Some kind of criteria which are important to be, um, or let's say to have an accepted kind of NUB agreement are not fulfilled. And hence it's basically kind of rejected in a way. Status four is let's say somewhere between, right? I mean, um, it is especially being provided or let's say decided on if some information are missing. And we've seen that, for example, if you have a, a drug a therapy which has been submitted in October, but maybe have not yet been launched, meaning the price is missing, then you might get a status of four. Sometimes there are also some kind of other reasons. I think important maybe, and that's maybe also a question for later on, uh, hospitals could at least negotiate, uh, I think, based on a status four, at least kind of, let's say, non-regular, but kind of negotiations as well for additional funding with a status four. I think that depends also a bit on the importance on maybe a bit as well on the kind of underlying um, uh, packages or data which are then available. So core question as well, I mean, that was the kind of easy part, right? I said already beforehand, if there's a loop submission, there's then at the same time then the kind of question if that might be a high risk procedure. And just in case, and you see that when you just start on the top of that kind of graph, um, then uh, there, there might as well be the kind of GBA uh, process being started in case the GBA is deciding uh, that this NIP is a high risk procedure. If not, let's say the pathway goes again, you see that kind of arrow directly here left to the hospital box, directly goes again back to the INEC and hence it's the kind of normal process we have just spoken about. Otherwise there's basically a kind of, um, a kind of added benefit um, evaluation. And that means also, and that's, I think, a cool question always for hospitals, at least what we hear is then also, do you have basically either the kind of information ready by the GBA that your procedure is not a high risk procedure, or in case you don't have that, do you already have the information available what is then being, or let's say, needed to be further submitted to the GBA afterwards, meaning any kind of evidence, because that's then the cool question back, because all, as we all know, the GBA is especially looking for um, clinical evidence or evidence-based medicine kind of information. And then it's basically the kind of question um, what is going or coming out there. So the outcomes could be, and you see that's a quite fast process when you compare that to other kind of procedures with the GBA. Uh, it's basically as well, another a kind of four months pro process until you have either a benefit which uh, can be seen as proven. That means everything fine. Then you, it basically goes, ahead so the evidence is strong enough or I think that's the important kind of two differentiations one that's in the middle um, that the benefit is not sufficiently proven but there's a so-called potential right and there might be even the kind of question on an experiment of coverage which is as well quite time consuming uh, or I think that's the worst outcome obviously no benefit and no potential can be seen as proven and hence then the decisions by the GBA to exclude that method and that's very important, especially when keeping in mind that normally, let's say the pathway we have just heard submission by the hospital, NUP status, and then we could go into the um, negotiations. So the hospital could go into the negotiations. So that's as well something keeping in mind. That is why we normally just, uh, um, uh, let's say, recommend as well checking that beforehand. Yes, let's say there are different criteria to be checked. So you see those here as well. Very simplified, obviously. I mean, uh, um, uh, is, is there basically a new theoretical scientific concept? Uh, was there a specific OPS code available? Um, and the high risk class, obviously, it's the kind of risk class of the medical device or procedure generally. And then I think there are two further questions based on loop requests for the first time submitted and specifically um, invasive. And I think that's all together very simplified now, um, which could then lead into the fact that the GBA might decide on a high risk procedure. I think important is um, companies can check that and discuss that. So do a kind of consultation with the GBA upfront, do that early enough. I think that's important. I think the GBA normally takes, I think at least around the six month time in order to come up then also with the kind of final minutes. And I think that's then the important information which is also 
uh, needed and requested by the hospitals. So that's the kind of frame. So what is happening after a successful NUP submission, meaning we're going into a NUP status one, and we maybe put the NUP status four into brackets, but I think the core and uh, a clear question is then what is happening after that. And I think for that, I, I'm happy to hand over um, to Dr. Markus Thalheimer from the University Clinic of Heidelberg. A lot of experience, obviously, in that area. I think also uh, an author of different kind of reference uh, books on the DRGs, lecture on the topics on DRG. So I think a real kind of a knowledge also what we now have um, on the inpatient funding. So happy to hand over to you, Dr. Thalheimer. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, and uh, I'm glad to be here and give you a little bit of insight in the next few minutes about um, the actually right now ongoing negotiations for the NUBs here in Baden-Württemberg in southern Germany. Um, these negotiations are centralized for about three years now. That means we are a, a small team of hospital experts and, and meet with um, uh, sick fund experts for the NUBs and uh, negotiate uh, the NUBs for all hospitals here in the area. And um, that's quite effective, but it's uh, also quite time consuming, as you might uh, imagine. Last week, we spent two whole days and uh, next week we will continue with another two whole days. And we are not done yet, uh, but 80% is already negotiated. Yeah, so that's quite good. And it's early in the year, as you see, so that's that's our goal always. What I might add to what you what you said about the 137H uh, procedure, the high risk uh, products, uh, it's very very important. And I might I might just um, add to what you said or, or uh, strengthen it even. Um, we had several products in in negotiation last week, and they they didn't have a clear status about this high-risk um, class product by, uh, from the joint committee. And so the SIG funds um, were not willing at all to, to talk about these products. Yeah? So this has to be done way before we start talking with the SIG funds about all these products. It has to be clear whether it is a high-risk product and has to go through the 137H procedure or it's not happily and can be uh, go through the uh, easy standard procedure. But without this clearance, um, um, yeah, sick funds won't even be uh, willing to talk to you about it. Huh? So it's, it's very, very important to get that clear before you start, yeah. Okay. Um, I have a few slides and might we, we might uh, use these. They, uh, they are basically German, so I don't know, Stefan. We can also switch. I have some English speaking. If that's better, what do you think? Uh, I, th I think I think we can use those as a basis. I think um, yeah, that's just fine. translate I think you speak anyway to it. Yes, exactly. It's 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 the agenda anyway. Just to have um, yeah. Okay, so how? how come innovations, medical innovations into a hospital, into our hospital here at the University Clinic in Heidelberg? It's um, basically uh, depends on where this product has the first contact to some member of our hospital. Ideal, the, the best way is it's a pharmacist or someone from our um, administrative uh, team that uh, that is um, responsible for let's say implants and all that um, it's not as good if the first contact to this product of this product is to a physician because then it's not the official procedure it's sometimes even used before we realize it's it's already in our hospital um, there is no reimbursement, there is no safety issue check, there is no patient information worked out and all that. So um, ideal is uh, the official contact for, for drugs, for, for medical products is uh, um, pharmacy, our hospital pharmacy, or um, um, the uh, department that is responsible for uh, all the um, medical products uh, and, and 
we um, actually we only allowed this first official way. Okay, now I'm back. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> that's what I already said. Uh, what happens if there is a, um, just a, um, implementation in our hospital that is not the official way? Um, um, the, the product is not known in our uh, system. There is no reimbursement. Um, sick funds um, don't want to talk about it. They don't know it as well. Um, um, all the costs around are not overviewed. Um, let's say um, you have sometimes you have to do an investment, have to have to buy um, um, uh, some uh, software product or whatever to use it, and uh, all that is not done and not not uh, not on in the right way. And patient safety and what I said, uh, patient information and all that is also not really organized. Okay, next one. So we have uh, two uh, standard processes for um, getting new uh, drugs or new medical products into our system. This is the slide for, for drugs. Uh, first step, um, leading physicians want to have a new drug, newly um, uh, uh, submitted drug, and, and they just uh, tell it uh, to our hospital, uh, to our um, pharmacy, or to medical controlling as well. And then we list it and then it goes to the drug commission, the so-called Arzneimittel Commission. And there it will be discussed, um, it will be checked and then listed in our hospital system. And then it's official, then it's into the system. And then uh, we from medical controlling start the reimbursement process. We check, is it already, um, uh, um, represented built into the DRG system. Do we have to activate the NUB process that what uh, Stefan just explained to you? Do we have to apply this for this new truck at the ENEC Institute for an NUB status? All that can be done then and there is usually plenty of time. Today we are half a year before deadline so that's actually not, not now but the next few weeks when we start all that uh, processes. There is um, the last um, line here, there is a, a little bypass um, for trucks. We um, screen the EMA homepage and we start actually with the NUB application even uh, before a truck is already applied from uh, by the EMA. So we have more time to, to do all these preparation work. Next one. Uh, for medical products, we have another commission that's the so-called Medizin Produkte Commission. That's quite the same as the Drug Commission, just for medical products, for implants and all that. We started that in 2012 as we realized that are more and more really expensive products that just uh, found their way to the patient without us noticing these products even. So all these negative things I, I told you before. And um, we only talk in this commission about um, um, products that are at least um, 2,500 euros uh, by price, because we don't want to talk about uh, gloves or some small products. We just want to get the, the really expensive and interesting ones. Um, all um, administrative uh, um, uh, departments are involved in this commission, even the law department that checks uh, treatments and checks uh, compliance rules and all that, uh, even in this early process. And it's a web-based uh, procedure and we, it takes us only 10 days to, um, to answer such an application by an, a, a medical department, okay? And that's just a slide how we do our decisions or we publish our decisions. It's, uh, uh, let, let's say the first question, will this product, this article, uh, will it be listed in our standard catalog in the hospital? Who has to pay for it? Uh, what will be uh, the amount of, of implants or products we would buy in the first, second year? The NUP process is addressed here. Um, 
uh, but also uh, special things as do we have a barcode do we have to uh, to um, develop a new barcode because um, <clears throat> we code all our products before they are implanted and so uh, get them by barcode on the bill um, on the drg bill it's an automatic process in the background and so every product has to has a barcode uh, that's just something um, quite a, a lot of hospitals do right now to get an easier process of uh, uh, coding as you as you explained before get, get an ops code and then a drg for this product yeah. by barcoding that's uh, quite interesting we also generate automatically the ops code for this product yeah. that makes it quite easy afterwards to get it on the bill um, then is there any other financing uh, or is there um, do we have to to buy some software product or some other device to get this product working and so we check just all aspects for this product and then we'll make a decision about listing it and then we start also as medical controllers with our um, noob application process in the background okay next one yeah that was just um, a, a little insight how we implement new products in our system and now i would just talk a few minutes about um, the nub negotiations uh, um, since three or well, for three years now since uh, 2020 we have centralized it for uh, our country here baden-württemberg in southern germany um, just um, drugs or medical products that only once hospital uses specially um, that will be negotiated by this hospital itself it wouldn't make sense to centralize that but all others it's about 25 percent uh, we talk to the sick funds uh, in, a, in a in a central negotiation um, and um, um, I, I said to you we we started last week in in march april usually this year it was 11th of april we started we have another uh, negotiation next week and then hopefully hopefully will be done by then and then um, publish um, this uh, new price list for 2022 um, 1st of june or the latest 1st of july that's our our goal for this year and then um, this uh, this pricing list nub pricing list will be used for the rest of the year and next year until the new price list then for 2023 will be ready and published um, um, all the treatments that happened until this first of june for example will also be paid by the same price um, um, since last year in germany there um, there was a yeah a gap in the law in the nub law that has been closed so we get this um, also this reimbursement uh, starting from the beginning of the year, even if we negotiated it later in the year. Okay. Next one, and then we are almost almost done and can discuss a little bit. Um, for drugs, there has been, especially for expensive drugs, there has already been established a pricing in the NUB negotiations that is close or exactly the AMNOC price that uh, trucks get in Germany after the first year in market. So um, all the text here in German basically says, why do we uh, still negotiate it, this time consuming all day difficult discussions with the, um, with the sick funds? If we are at the end at the same price as uh, the MNOC for the um, outpatient uh, setting is set, so there are um, thoughts to combine these two systems, the in and the outpatient pricing, and just take for NUBs for inpatient uh, prices just the MNOC price that is already existing. Yeah? That would make it a lot easier. It's called the super new procedure that uh, the German uh, um, Cancer Society has called it that way, and they also prefer this uh, new, yeah, modified system. 
it's not decided yet by the new government in Germany. And um, I hope there will be some reforming process in the next one or two years to get to this um, synchronizing AMNOC and NUB negotiations at the end. Okay, next one. Um, the other part that was about drugs um, and MNOC is only for drugs and for medical products, implants and, and heart valves and all that. Uh, we have other procedures. Uh, Stefan already explained to you this uh, 137H high risk medical product uh, system. It's quite a hurdle for new products. Um, it's very bureaucratic and you have to, as Stefan explained already to you, you have to prove this new product has a potential of an, uh, um, yeah, treatment alternative and um, hospitals that go that way with 137 product um, have to do a lot of, oh, hold on. Okay. Something happened. I think we lost Dr. Thalheimer. I guess maybe it was the uh, the kind of uh, energy supply. I don't know, uh, but it's for, for, for probably more the energy supply for the computer. We'll just see that maybe in the next couple of seconds. I guess he might as well come back uh, shortly. But I think we can maybe just uh, uh, use that time and maybe uh, as well get Lutz again back into the kind of uh, Yes, Arena. Yeah. Here, <laughs> so okay. Of course, I'm there, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm there. Uh, we can ask. Uh, I mean, we have a lovely audience tonight, and we already have the first questions here. Um, so uh, the first questions uh, the our lovely audience raises actually: Can a company submit a noob? A very simple answer: No. Uh, very, very important here. Um, Hospitals need to submit that because obviously, obviously, hospitals need as well to code internally. That's also what um, we both have just, um, let's say, said the last couple of minutes, right? I mean, it's a combination between the ICD, the OPS, then comes to the DRG, and the DRG plus then the potential additional funding through the Zusatz and Geld would then make basically make the final uh, budget up for that kind of procedure. And hence, um, companies cannot do that meaning that only hospitals can submit it. Okay, and we already heard from Dr. Time, well, that's a little bit tricky, right? The company that should approach, not the physicians, because then the physician's probably gonna mess it up um, and just use it and the hospitals can say that. that. So um, uh, maybe we can later also ask when he's back to Marcus Talheimer about that, but, how can a company actually support the new process? Is there like a, um, are there like a, um, what can a company do? I mean, they can ask us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we can uh, uh, provide like the information, what information actually the hospital needs, right? We just heard it from uh, Dr. Taheimer. Of course, the hospital needs uh, safety data, um, efficacy data, right? Uh, because they, need to have it there, right? Um... Yeah, I'm, I mean, it, it, it's a couple of things here. And I think um, I've just seen uh, that also Martin Hook, I mean, he's also uh, a core, let's say, payer in one of the other large uh, hospital clinics in Bad Wittmer. So welcome as well to the webinar. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think he has already written as well, but um, that hospitals as well receive, let's say, prepared applications. I mean, that is for sure, with then I think also answering a bit, I think your question looks right. I mean, um, companies can obviously um, help or let's say support the kind of whole, let's say process in the way that they could either, let's say, um, um, make the, the different information available to the hospitals, meaning the, especially obviously how the product could be used and which ways it is being used, et cetera. But let just the kind of application form can be filled out. Um, a lot of companies, and that's, I think, Lutz, what you have as well, I think just said, are, let's say, preparing, for example, with the help of, as well, other experts, um, uh, such a kind of applications. Um, that's, that can also be done, obviously, for example, through then 
that further support sometimes even through the medical association. So there are a couple of anchors there. I think um, what I also just wanted to quickly um, touch base on, uh, because I think I had it on the slide before, but I haven't mentioned it, but you have as well, again, mentioned kind of studies, et cetera. Um, in the NOOP application form, at least for that first part here, right? Um, it's not a must that you need to have, uh, for example, randomized controlled trial or any kind of other, let's, let's say high quality clinic evidence available. Let's call it that way, right? But still, we need to differentiate, differentiate here as well a bit between the different process steps, right? The first one is very simple. Let's call it the NOOP process itself. So it's a question uh, whether the product is innovative according to the system and not adequately be funded, because those are the cool two key decision drivers. And then the second part, which is then going into the kind of negotiations between the hospital or the group of hospitals, as we have just heard, and the um, uh, and the uh, health insurance fund, because that's obviously a totally different game that we have just heard. Some um, NUBs are not even negotiated and discussed because those, uh, let's say, companies have maybe as well missed just to get the kind of confirmation by the GBA that it's not a high risk procedure, right? So you could obviously imagine uh, in which ways, um, especially also then health insurance funds might, let's say, react if you have a new procedure with not a lot of evidence and lot, not a lot of clinical evidence suddenly available, right? So that's for sure where you still need to have some kind of not only clinical evidence, but a lot of times, obviously, as well, the kind of, let's say, evidence being published. And ideally as well in a very similar environment, right? So that's that's still where, yes, of course you need it, but it's maybe not for the application, but it's rather than for the negotiation afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that's again, going back to also your first question, how could, for example, a company support? Yes, of course, it's not only around the application, but also then the negotiation leads like Dr. Talheimer, for example, um, and the group around uh, him and, and the others that were in individual hospitals as well, they need as well to have the kind of information available that they mm -hmm. can as well prepare themselves optimally for those negotiations. Mm -hmm. And now I think we have Dr. Talheimer back. Very good. Yes, I'm back. Ah, Sorry, for some of my, my computer crashed and I had to reboot it. So, but we were, we were through with the slides. So luckily there was nothing. Yes. Yeah. No worries, no worries. <laughs> Everything good again. I think, uh, yeah, you can, I think, even turn on again the uh, video. I think that should now yeah. also work. So, okay. Yeah, we just had the questions. Um, can a company actually submit a noob? And uh, no, that is not possible. No. Exactly. And then we covered the question how a company can actually support a noob application. I mean, as we heard of you, it's not really smart just to go to the physician, give him the product, right? And the product somewhere floating around the hospital and no one actually knows about the coding and the reimbursement, right? Exactly, um, exactly. My, my recommendation is talk to, if it is a medical product, talk to, of course, the physicians, they have to decide whether to use it or not. Um, um, but then also talk to the medical controller, talk to some administrative patients, uh, not patients, of course, uh, people that are responsible for this implementation and this NUB process. And so everything will get sorted and the way it has to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, for the NOP application itself, uh, support is always welcome with data we need. Um, yeah especially medical products, we need a lot of information because there we don't have a, an AMA um, uh, um, process. Uh, process, yeah. so exactly. And, and uh, so um, we need a lot of data and evidence data to persuade the SIG funds afterwards in the negotiations, because um, it's always these two, two steps. The first is, get the allowance to negotiate mm -hmm. yeah, by this uh, new application at the uh, DRG Institute. And then second part, the negotiations. And for both steps, we have to be prepared with, uh, with a lot of data. And there's mm -hmm. always uh, mm -hmm. help welcome for the hospitals. Yeah, Because yeah. every that's also, that's very bureaucratic. Every hospital has to do an application for every product every year again. Mm -hmm. And that makes it um, quite a, a lot of work. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. 
<laughs> how many how many no publications do you submit just to get an impression in Heidelberg a year? Just for our hospitals, it's about 250 to 300. Almost, okay. almost all of them get status one. So mm -hmm. you can imagine what we have to negotiate later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that yeah. is that is like almost <laughs> like a, a, a one nope a day, right? One nope a work That's a day. one nope a day. That's like one apple a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one nope a day is, is not as healthy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So just just to have an impression. Yeah. So and, and I mean nope is already covering a lot about you. We you we heard about the high uh, uh, price devices. We heard about uh, or we know about tissues, right? That are like mm -hmm. now also being a nope, and these tissues. So some of them need a CE certificate, some of them need like other certifications, right? And exactly. the best way to support the hospital is just to provide, to be mm -hmm. active there, to provide all the paperwork, right? Because the hospital is responsible for it, do exactly. I get that right? Yeah. And has to prove it also against the uh, uh, health insurances. So the health insurances are the first, well, do I have to pay for that, right? Is it allowed? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, that's it. And even um, we we are even responsible, at least part in part responsible in the uh, 137 H process for these high risk medical products. And so that's also a lot of work to do. And that's uh, more than um, I sometimes call this law an um, innovation prevention law because it mm. really keeps us from using these products. It's, it's, mm. uh, it's a shame. It's way too complicated. It's by, yeah, uh, it was the plan to make it complicated, yeah, to keep hospitals mm. uh, a bit away from it, but still we need these products. So we have to go through and it's, it's a lot of work, yeah. But could, could you maybe as well give a kind of impression how many of the, let's say the submitted NUBs would really be high risk procedures? Ah, uh, that's hard to say. I would say about 20% right now. Mm -hmm. wow. But that will be more in the next few years because there are still products, you showed it in the, in the one slide, uh, that had already been asked or applied as an, an NUB. And so they are, they don't fall under this uh, law. Mm -hmm. And uh, these products will become less and less the next few years so we have more high-risk products uh, that have to go through this uh, yeah it's Interesting, yeah yeah 20 25 percent right now at least in, in our setting and will yeah be more than a third or 40 percent the next few years i guess yeah yeah Interesting. Mm -hmm. great so we have six months to go um so if a company is fast they can get like the um, the question to the GBA is it uh, 137H, a high risk product, right? Mm -hmm. And that and before a hospital even touches the nope, they want to have a clear answer on the question. Am I correct? That's the best way. Yeah, that makes it a lot easier. You you can still second best way. You can still do that a little bit later in the background while the uh, 100 uh, while the noob application is already running but that makes it complicated because enec DRG institute will give another status then you have to answer in the negotiations the question whether it is a, a high risk product or not whether it's already classified or not so the easiest and best way is always to do it right at the beginning yeah mm -hmm. makes sense yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have a question from the audience, a really detailed question. So um, where uh, in the new publication, I mean, there you have to include a rough number of estimates of inpatient uh, uh, patients, a number uh, that you wanted to treat during the year one with this prospective product. And yeah. the question is pretty simple. How do you come up with a proper estimate? Um, I use a dice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this number is just from the beginning is in the in that data. It's just nonsense. Yeah. The INEC always says, yeah, we need this number to get a feeling. Is it for two million or is it for 10? Mm. But um, that's 
they could have the answer easier and not let every hospital put a number in in the database. Yeah, but I I, I mean, dice. I was just joking, of course. But <laughs> it's it's really a, a rough estimate what we do here, and it's not very important. But if it, I'm not I'm not in maybe the health insurance is coming back on the negotiations and maybe nailing you down with that number? Yeah, in the beginning they tried, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't matter actually because um, the law uh, for the NUBs in Germany says we only negotiate a price and not the number of patients we are allowed. It's different to um, what, what you showed, the uh, additional charge, the Zusatzentgelt. Mm -hmm. We also have to negotiate the number of patients we are planning to treat the, the, the actual year. Mm -hmm. NUBs, the number of patients uh, doesn't matter at all. And whether we treat 10 and bill it to the, to the sick funds or we treat 1,000, they have to pay. Of course, they are not amused if we, uh, and they always, <laughs> try to get a, a rough guess from us how, how, how many patients uh, uh, will come this year. But uh, actually there was something interesting last week. Um, sick funds asked us to reduce the number of patients we, um, we had told them because um, the, the sum, the, all the um, uh, NUBs, were way too expensive for them and so they wanted to lower the <laughs> the amount of money a little bit so you see it's just a, yeah. a playing with numbers and that doesn't really matter at the end mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. they have to pay it anyway once mm -hmm. there is a, a price uh, fixed yeah yeah and we we have another question from the audience and it's about the drugs right i mean we have the unlock process and uh, that's what's uh, in the background is actually, it's, that's for the outpatient setting, but for the inpatient setting, why do I need their uh, NUP? Because the price, the drug is already reimbursed. Stefan or Dr. Thalheimer, can you explain a little bit about that? Why is a NUP for a new drug, which is may, uh, started in um, now uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in the middle of the year, why is that needed? The answer is quite easy because the AMNOC price is only valid for outpatient settings and not for inpatients. So, and that's what, what I tried to explain. Once we were able, I mean, the lawgiver has to do that, but once we were able to synchronize this NUB process with the AMNOC process, then exactly that would happen, what, what the, uh, the question addresses. We don't. We would not need to negotiate NUBs any longer for trucks. It would yeah. just be set by the AMNOC price. And um, I, I guess the the problem in Germany, because it's not or it has not happened yet, is because the truck companies are still allowed to set the price completely freely for uh, free for the first year. Mm -hmm. And SIG funds are a little bit in panic that there might be a price that they would also have to pay as an, an NUB reimbursement, an NUB price. And so once this first year is under control, I, I guess it would happen quite fast that we would uh, get these, uh, would put these two systems together in an outpatient reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Hey, can I maybe just, just add there as well? I mean, we all know, let's say the situation that Let's say the EMA is not just simply deciding in August and September of the year on, on a new label, right? So on the approval of a new drug. So um, how are you dealing with, for example, situation, a drug is being approved, let's say in November, and the company is putting that, um, let's say, onto the German market as well, still in, already in November, and just assuming that at least some patients are being treated as well in the inpatient setting, meaning you basically don't have the ability to um, let's say, uh, submit a loop until October next year. How do you deal with that in your um, environment in Heidelberg? Uh, you're mute again. Sorry, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. For the very expensive drugs like gene therapy, ATMPs, as you showed, um, we actually uh, negotiated with, with the sick fund case by case just mm -hmm. for a special patient. And that works mm -hmm. quite well. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, for the regular trucks um, there has been adopted two new NUB statuses um, they they were not yet on your one slide because they are so brand new and the one status says um, you can already negotiate in advance for a product that will come on the market for the, in somewhere next few months and and can so so to say um, have an NUB price before the truck is even there and then just mm -hmm. took it, take it out of the drawer and use it the moment the truck uh, is is uh, is uh, launched approved by the EMA and on the market in Germany or in Europe yeah exactly mm -hmm. so this NUB gap, as we call it, becomes smaller and smaller every year, but it's still there, of course. There might be still a few trucks that just, yeah, just squeeze in between all these systems and then just are not reimbursed for, yeah, quite a certain time. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Great. So I think that were like all questions from the audience. I don't see any more questions. Oh, no, there's another one popping up, <laughs> as, as always. Oh, no, it just says, thank you, Dr. Tahimer. Much appreciated. Very informative. That's really nice of your audience. <laughs> we yeah. love you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Tahimer, for the great insights. Uh, thank you also, Stefan. And just before to the coming to the end, uh, we want to point out again on our market access podcast um, and here we have the inpatient funding episodes 9 and 10 so you want to get on your iOS, Apple podcast or Spotify uh, and uh, check out here with our good friend Willy Werner here from the medical clinic in about uh, Wurbingen. The inpatient way for medical products is complex but mostly easily adoptable and also with uh, 10, with our good friend, Dr. Sebastian Kasu, who's in the emergency room here at the Sculptures Clinics. How do you, how do innovation reach patients in German hospitals? So we have two wonderful podcast episodes with them also going a little bit in detail here, uh, also about the process you described tonight, Dr. Tarheimer, um, to, to, to reach the, the physicians, but also do not forget to reach the administration. Okay. Exactly. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll see. Uh, I mean, we are here bridge building right between uh, industry and uh, payers and users. Uh, so it's just all the uh, way of communicating. And that's also a good point here before we finish to communicate here to you, lovely audience, about our next webinar. Today is actually boys or girls and boys day. So, you know, girls should go into boys um, work and vice versa. So what would be better to announce uh, two great colleagues here who are joining us for our next webinar. So on May 19th, this is not the last Thursday of the month. So it's a little bit earlier because due to holidays here in Germany, our good friend Ariane Schenk from the Bitcom Health is joining us. Uh, and also our good friend from Adesso, um, which is a digital health solutions provider, IT provider here. Yvonne Gründler is also joining us. And with the two girls, we are discussing two-year DIGAS in Germany. So you see, uh, it's not only geek, uh, but also here, girl power. Um, two years DIGAS in Germany, is it success or lost opportunity? Um, that will be a really interesting discussing here also, uh, we also discussed sometimes with Dr. Tarheim, right? Also digitalization in hospitals would also be a great, another topic here. Okay, so turn on your devices on May 19th, uh, 2100 German time or 1200 Pacific time. Yeah, so that's it for today. Once again, thank you, Dr. Tarheimer. You're welcome. And thank you, Stefan. And so uh, good night to everyone. Thank you okay. all. Have a good Thank evening. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.